Hello, bonjour. My name is Megan, and on behalf of the Ottawa Art Gallery, I would like to welcome you to our virtual OAG Artist Talk with artist Martin Godet. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that the Ottawa Art Gallery operates on the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. In this video series, the 2020 graduates of the University of Ottawa's MFA program return virtually to speak about their artistic practice, their work, and what they're up to now. Following Emergent, their showcase of recent and new work at the OEG earlier this year. In this video, I am pleased to introduce Martin Godet. Martin is a visual artist from Northern Ontario, currently based in Ottawa. Martin's practice draws upon his background growing up in a small mining community where the physicality of manual labor and working class expectations of masculine identity and sexuality were formative to his self-awareness as an artist. Martin is a recent MFA graduate from the University of Ottawa where he received the Charles Gagnon Scholarship. Martin completed a BFA with distinction from OCAD University in 2015. Thank you so much for tuning in. And without further ado, I would like to hand the screen over to Martin. Hello, bonjour. My name is Martin Godin. I am an artist currently based in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, where I'm recording this on the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. Welcome to my virtual artist talk and studio visit. I'm originally from a small Francophone mining community in Northern Ontario near Sudbury in the Robinson Huron Treaty Territory, the traditional land of the Adik Amekshang Anishinaabeg. As a first generation student, I completed a BFA with distinction in drawing and painting at OCAD University in Toronto in 2015. I then completed a Master's of Fine Arts, une maîtrise en art visuel at the University of Ottawa in 2020 where I was the grateful recipient of the Charles Gagnon Scholarship. I was drawn to study at the University of Ottawa due to its unique bilingual studio-based program. I want to thank the Ottawa Art Gallery for the opportunity to exhibit my thesis work Paydirt earlier this year as part of the exhibition Emergent, Emergence, and for providing a platform. If you're not familiar with my work in this video, I will discuss my art practice and the artworks included in the exhibit. My MFA thesis work, Paydirt, Bonne Venn, is a series of paintings that reflect my ongoing research into the use of slag rock as an artistic medium to explore the connections between painting and our rapidly changing world. Slag rock is the mining byproduct that is disposed of once valuable ores and metals have been extracted in a mining process called smelting. The term pay dirt in the field of mining refers to the discovery of valuable ores after digging through the rock, muck, and lesser minerals. To me, pay dirt is the insight that comes with distance and time, a sort of mining of the self. Pay dirt seeks to express how we overcome imposed structures, the sedimentary layers and sequestered caverns of our inner selves that shape, contain, and eventually constrain us over time demanding self-reinvention. Through my work, I reflect upon continuity and change, the oscillation between cultural ferment and watershed, and the formation of community and identity. Having grown up as a gay youth during the 1970s and 1980s in a small mining community, the physicality of manual labor and working class expectations of masculinity were formative to my self-awareness as an artist. By the time I graduated high school in the early 1990s, I had decided that I did not want to follow in the footsteps of most of my family members by working in the mines. I wanted to be an artist. I wanted to leave the small town, move to the big city, and find community as a gay youth, and eventually seek out my vo artistic vocation. The solitude of this period of my life nourished the inspiration that would eventually inform my artistic practice. It was during this time that I first began to collect found objects, particularly rocks with unique shapes, colors, and intriguing mimetoliths. A mimetolith is a rock or mineral specimen that resembles something else, such as an animal, object, or body part. The more odd they were, the more they appealed to me, and I would take etchings and rubbings of those too large to bring home. My father took note of my interest 
and would occasionally bring home uniquely shaped rocks, including samples of nickel ore, copper, ignis, and slag rock, as you can see here. Before long, my room was full of them. My experience was typical for a gay youth in the 1980s. At that time, being gay was taboo, and open hatred and harassment of gay people was tolerated. Stoked by the sudden rise of the AIDS crisis and the panic it engendered. Information about AIDS filtered out into society so slowly and ignorance and prejudice filled the gap. Like many gay youth, I was far from the cosmopolitan urban centers I would later seek out. But I was very self-aware and I had inwardly accepted my difference and the imperative of concealing it. Looking back, I now wonder how my child self was able to decipher what was happening and accept it, while also being fully cognizant of the self-preserving need for camouflage and to keep it to myself. The closet simultaneously arose from within and was imposed from without, and art making became a natural outlet for me. At this time in my youth, the Much Music channel introduced me to culture, music, Ginny Becker's fashion television, and artists like Andy Warhol, Keith Haring, The Art Collective, General Idea, Madonna, and Maestro Fresh West. It provided me a window onto a larger world at a time long before the internet, YouTube personalities, reality television, and downloadable a la carte culture consumption. It showed me there were much more to discover beyond my small town, and that there were other ways of behaving connecting, finding community, and looking at things. This period exuded a sense of community, the artist and the street in synchronicity, visual art simpatico with synthesized beatbox music and freestyle breakdance. For a youth like me, it generated a great sense of anticipation for the wider cultural world and community I long to become part of. My studio practice is a place of solitary action and contemplation. I am drawn to the use of extracted materials in art and enjoy studying the historical origins of painting and the process of preparing materials from pigment to canvas rooted in the traditions that predate the Renaissance. When I say that I use unconventional materials, this is what I'm talking about. This here is slag, a slag rock sample. En français, on l'appelle de la roche-slag ou scurry. In the mining process, molten slag rock is disposed of in open pits called slag dumps, where it then hardens back into solid rock, covering the landscape like dead bones. My process begins with field study research, observation, gathering samples as found objects that are then documented. By pulverizing and refining slag rock into pigment, I resurrect these discarded bones and imbue them with purpose in my work. What was forgotten and disposed of is given new form on the canvas by mixing them with traditional painting media made from scratch, building, stretching, grinding, mixing, and painting. I think that metaphorically, the recombination of the materials reenact the mining process, excavating memory and identity to rediscover the internal self in constant formation, destruction, and recreation. So in a sense, slag rock is the protagonist of this series of artworks and of my practice. As you can see in this work, Pangemu, it is pulverized slag rock on raw linen that has been seized and primed, Rochelag et l'huile sur laine. This work is intended to be the first work you see in the exhibition. It was originally intended as a maquette for a larger painting, but I was happy with the intimate details and decided to display it as an amuse-bouche, as Canadian artist Beth Stewart would say, intended for viewers to get a closer look at the minimalist representation and get a sense of the gritty, natural essence of the materials. The interaction and alchemy of these materials is complex, with significant and sometimes unexpected variations. The materials need the proper time to realize their full effects, especially when applying thin layers of glazes or a thick amount of raw slag onto the canvas. The materials can become murky when combined with traditional oils or wax. It sort of has a mood of its own. These studio recipes and processes need careful consideration and each layer needs the time to breathe. 
I do believe that you have to be in the right mindset. It's like the materials absorb the energy and attention you bring into them. My experimental use of the materials introduced an element of serendipity into the work, with different interactions producing varying effects over time. As an artist, I become entirely absorbed in the art making process and the transformation of materials. This work, Guirlande, uses slag rock refined into varying gradients, leaving it to drip in the oil application to mimic the marks of graffiti artists. The thick application of pulverized slag rock resembles black spray paint when viewed from afar. As suggested in the title, Guirlande references a Christmas tree. I'm always fascinated by all the Christmas trees seen discarded at the curb after the holidays, skeletal and dried out, but still adorned with strands of tinsel. The thick garland in slag is a nod to the grandiose spiral jetty by Robert Smithson. The large land or eco art done at Rosal Point in Great Salt Lake, Utah in 1970. It always strikes me as a work that must have disrupted so much natural habitat. Ironically, the work is near oil drilling sites and was the location where many artists protested in oppositions of the drilling plans in 2008. Gitteland is a queer response to the land being extracted of its natural resources. Many Canadian artists and writers have elaborated on Northern development to develop themes of culture, identity and climate change through representations of the landscape. This includes Peter Hodgins and Peter Thompson who examined the extractive gaze in their essay, Taking the Romance Out of Extraction, published in 2011. Canadian painter Charles Comfort's mural, The Romance of Nickel, commissioned by Inco Limited to celebrate industry, was originally painted for the Canadian Pavilion at the 1937 International Exhibition in Paris, the same exhibit that featured Picasso's Guernica. However, in contrast, Comfort's uncommissioned paintings depict a more bleak and somber landscape, making a more critical statement about industry and the environment, as seen in his painting Smelter Stacks Copper Glyph, done in 1936 and currently on display at the National Gallery of Canada. Guirlande also alludes to a snake shedding its skin in a molting state of metamorphosis. When I collect samples during field studies, I often have to carefully avoid snakes as they sun themselves among the rocks, where I often see their shedded skins. I'm also often reminded of David Wojnarowicz's Face and Dirt from 1991, a self-portrait of the artist immersed in dirt and rock with only his face revealed, eliciting a sense of submergence, drowning, and breaching the surface for air as well as a reflection on life, death, and family. When I was young, my first introduction to art was at our local church. To my child's eyes, it was like entering a gallery or a museum with wall-to-wall -wall images, sculptures, and icons of saints and martyrs. This captivated me instantly. The art in the church featured male bodies, sometimes languid, sometimes straining and riven, their faces at once raptured, tortured, and contemplative. This showed me a layer of perception far removed from the everyday life in a northern Canadian mining town. This insight did not lead me into further detachment. Rather, I began to recognize this new layer all around me. I realized that popular culture and art are replete with symbolic references that echo, mimic, and riff upon those sacred images, leading me first to respond on an emotional level before slowly deciphering their cultural and personal meaning. I wanted to capture that sensation in my painting of Aporia. My intent was to place a figurative representation devoid of a background or landscape, left only with the slag rock pigment drips in oil to provide a chiaroscuro smoke and mirror atmosphere. I knew I would be installing this work among abstract paintings of landscapes, so I wanted to generate a contrast between the figurative painting and the abstract works. The inspiration behind the title Aporia comes from Jean-Paul Rico's 2014 book, The Decision Between Us. He remarks on aporia as a feature of time, space, and intimacy, using it to describe those in-between moments when decisions are made. Aporia measures the time and distance between thought and action, contemplation and decision, 
doubt, and confidence. The time spent revisiting those inner sedimentary layers that hold so many truths. For the artist, aporia can be a, the state of brainstorming, sketching, reading, and conceptual thinking. In such moments, the artist is open to detail and abstraction simultaneously. This work features a friend of mine who posed for the image I used to compose the painting. My use of photography as a tool in my work was partially inspired by a Canadian painter, Attila Richard Lukács, who has had a significant influence upon my practice. Lukács' work marked a return of the figure in art that coincided with the peak of the AIDS crisis at the sunset of the Cold War era, when society and culture were starkly reminded of the fragility of the body as young men wasted away, sent without recourse to their deathbeds in the prime of their lives. Lukács' drawing use of raw masculine nudes and imagery confronts the viewer with a visceral neo-expressionist statement fusing working class masculinity, youth rebellion, and illicit homosexual desire. The symbolism of the miner's helmet and lamp and the slag rock itself are objects associated with working class and heterosexual masculinity. In my artwork, their symbolic power is adopted and subverted in a manner similar to Judith Butler's elaboration in her 1993 book, Bodies That Matter, on the use of drag to subvert interpolation and do reiterations of norms associated with societal hierarchies and power structures. The semi-nudity unveils the male body as described in Amelia Jones' 1998 book, Body Art Performing the Subject, while suggesting fragility, also reflected in my choice to expose raw linen, contrasting flesh and rock, life and death, paint and canvas. It also interrogates the performative ritual of returning to the closet. For example, when visiting my hometown as an adult, gay men must return to the closet again and again, compartmentalizing their liberated selves in an uneasy truth with the status quo, and then continually reenact their liberation and return to themselves. This reenactment and self-alienation and reunion is a life and death cycle of the inner self. My use of slag rock in my artwork interrogates this cycle and reflects upon the tension between inner beauty and ugliness, self-acceptance and self-rejection, life and death. Beauty is achieved through unity of the self when people are fully able to inhabit themselves and present their whole selves to the world. Slag is what is left behind when stone is denatured of its valuable ores, and it's not an obvious choice for use in art. It is a rejected detritus of a man-made process, solidified into fluid shapes, found and adopted by the artist as a mean of self-expression. This unconventional arrangement, as seen here, epitaph, physically engages the viewer to look down at the artwork in an active observation, simulating a field study. To lift the painting off the floor, I made a concrete block using a makeshift mold. This arrangement, or painting as assemblage, is also my queer response to the post-war art movement, Arte Povera, which also made use of industrial found objects. Epitaph represents a tombstone with the slag rocks stitched into the surface with linen threads as a sort of four-letter elegy or lament for the distance traveled in time, especially when I contemplate the span from the 1970s to the present. In retrospect, this was a very gritty time in recent history. Political upheaval occurred hand-in-hand -hand with cultural watershed. The Cold War, nuclear standoff, the Reagan-Thatcher era, the Chernobyl disaster, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the disintegration of the Soviet Union, and the HIV AIDS crisis occurred at a cultural crossroad where disco, glam rock, techno, pop art, and early grunge converged at the dusk, high noon, and twilight of their respective movements. This was also the time when the fashions of neon, denim, punk, preppy, goth, and military surplus vied on urban streets, long before lazy 90s conformity settled in. All of this might have been too much for a gay teen, but it cemented my determination to break away and continue seeking out that numinous layer that held so much truth. 
During the mid-90s, I finally moved to Ottawa, which at that time had a vibrant queer scene. It had gay bookstores, coffee shops, restaurants, dance clubs, drag cabarets, leather bars, bathhouses, newspapers, cruising spots, and a village map that stretched from Dalhousie Street to Elgin Street to Somerset Bank and Spark Street, all the way across the river to Old Hall. This was a perfect setting for a gay youth to come out of the closet and find community. People gathered in public spaces to dance, listen to live music, look at art, to be seen or just to sit around and read in solitude. I often found myself at the market station in the Byward Market Courtyard, sitting among older patrons and listen to their stories of lost friends and acquaintances, including stories of eviction, disownment, and squalid lonely endings. The cultural impact of the HIV AIDS crisis has yet to be fully appraised, and it was a looming preoccupation of the era. My painting Bolide represents a bright fireball that explodes in the sky and pierces the atmosphere. A large meteorite struck the Sudbury region in the Precambrian era, pushing all of the natural resources to the side of the impact crater, forming a massive ring where all of the mines are located today. The slag rock inserted into the surface of this work is a nod to the architectural intervention designed by the Art Collective General Idea on the facade of the Ottawa Courthouse and Land Registry Office on Elgin Street. Their work, titled The Canadian Shield, done in 1986, features giant rocks piercing through the walls of the building. Every time I walked by them as an MFA student on my way to the University of Ottawa campus, I felt very inspired. In Bolide, the accumulated slag is intended to give the impression of burnt ghost trees or of dead bones. The application of the slag mimics abstract expressionists and the gestural techniques in which they applied their materials on a flat surface. It was intentional that the artwork be displayed next to a poria so that the rock is at the same eye level or in close proximity to the figure's face, like a thrown object in midair prior to impact. In summary, slag rock from the Subri Basin is the detritus that results from a long series of astronomical, geological, and human interactions culminating in the environmentally devastating process of resource extraction. The slag is extracted, discarded, found, and imbued with meaning through my use of the stone. The discarded bones are reconstituted, restored, and given purpose. My process of collecting, breaking, pulverizing, and mixing the slag rock into paint is part of the mining of the self, whereby I unearth the past and dismantle the closet, recombining the discarded remnants and revivifying them in my art. My rendering of the slag rock effectively queers it beyond the Deleuzean notion of simply breaking the stone. I mix the slag with traditional painting materials where it interacts to create a new whole. Slag rock is profoundly queer to me, extracted, discarded, transformed, yet innately of the earth. I seek to mine the sediment and stone, excavating memory to recombine the raw materials of the self in pursuit of resolution. As J.J. Cohen wrote in his 2015 book, Stone, an Ecology of the Inhuman, stone does its own theorizing, always on its way to the artwork, both material and metaphor, emblem and fact. The fixed point from which origins proceed, moorage for a volatile world. I do want to take a special moment to thank the gallery staff, Catherine St. Clair, Megan Ho, Dan Austin, and all of the installation technicians. A special thank you to Rosemary Donegan, Adam Welsh, Laura Millard, Nicole Collins, Penny Cousineau Levine, Andrea Fitzpatrick, Lorraine Gilbert, and Lee Hamilton. Also, credits to the photographer, Justin Wanacott, for the photographs of the exhibition installation. You can keep in touch by following my website, including my Instagram, at martingodin.ca. Thank you.